Okay. Uh, okay. Before our uh, our voting meeting, uh, we have uh, Miss Peg uh, Pennypacker here to provide uh, the board an update on the uh, Title IX. Is this working? It is. Okay. Okay. Good evening. I was starting to say that uh, prior to our voting meeting tonight, uh, we have Ms. Uh, Peg Pennypacker here to provide uh, the board and the community an update on where we are with Title IX. Uh, so we had allotted uh, 30 minutes, but we're already about 15 minutes uh, behind schedule. So, uh, Ms. Pennypacker, I'll ask you to uh, headline uh, through the presentation, and certainly we can take questions from the board uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, so thank you very much for your, your flexibility. You bet, and thanks for having me here this evening to give my presentation relative to the Title IX Athletic Compliance program review um, just quickly and I will move quickly just to remind you who I am and we've all met before so it's good to see everyone uh, but it's my pleasure to be here this evening to talk to you about the process the findings and the recommendations based on the uh, compliance review that I performed here at uh, Boyertown Area School District in November of 2018, Boyertown Area School District Athletic Director Mr. Nick Palladino contacted high school Title IX Consulting Services in order to initiate the process of conducting a Title IX audit review of the school district's athletic program. This was a voluntary initiative in order to review and analyze the school district's athletic program relative to Title IX compliance and to evaluate any areas where improvement may be needed in order to ensure gender equity within the athletic program. The process began early in 2019 with the final report and executive summary presented to the school district's administration in this past September. Tonight's presentation highlights the process, the outcome, and suggested recommendations in order for the district to continue moving towards Title IX compliance in its athletic program. And just as a brief review, the 37-word statute, original statute of uh, Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 is listed on the bottom of the slide. And again, essentially saying that schools that receive any stream of federal money cannot discriminate on the basis of sex in any educational program or activity in the school. And just a few reminders. Uh, of the general concepts relative to Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. And I had presented this information to you before, but just as a reminder, it's the first comprehensive federal law that prohibits sex discrimination in education programs and activities that receive federal financial assistance. And all public schools do receive some stream of federal funding. It's not a sports law. Title IX is not a sports law. It covers many programs, which is about all our pro programs in our schools. Um, but the Office for Civil Rights, uh, the Office for Civil Rights under the Department of Education considers athletics an education program, so it's part of our educational process. Mm -hmm. Title IX does not only protect females, it protects all students, boys and girls, faculty, staff. It covers sexual harassment and sexual assault in our schools, which is really the big hot button today in K-12 schools. And school districts need to pay particular attention to the sexual harassment issues and priorities. Title IX requires schools to maintain policies, practices, programs, procedures in order not to discriminate against anyone based on sex. And of course, it is at the heart of the efforts to create gender equitable schools in our country. So what does it cover? Again, the laundry list relative to sex discrimination, all of those areas listed on the left-hand column. Of course, we're going to focus tonight on athletics and the athletic program here at Boyertown Area School District. And relative to sexual harassment, it does cover all of those items listed on the right-hand side under sexual harassment, including retaliation or the prohibited, prohibited uh, action of 
retaliation. Looking at all the education programs in our schools, we need to include athletics in the mix as the OCR, Office for Civil Rights, under the Department of Education considers athletics to be an educational program. And if we embrace the mission of the National Federation of State High School Associations and the National Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association, we essentially operate education-based athletics in our schools that are part of the educational process, an extension of the classroom where we use teachable moments to teach life lessons to our young people who participate in our athletic program in order to help them grow to be healthy and productive adults in society. This time I would like to focus on the athletic program and congratulations to Boyertown Area School District's girls soccer team who won the PIAA state championship in the 4A classification. Congratulations girls. And certainly congratulations to all of Boyertown Area School District's fall sports teams on their success this past fall season and good luck to the uh, winter and spring uh, sports student athletes as we proceed through the school year. As we look at the athletics compliance framework, we want to remember two things or really look at two basic areas. We want to focus on the area of participation opportunities, which we analyze through um, something called a three-prong test or a three-part test. We want to make sure we are accommodating, we're, we're sufficing full and effective accommodations of interests and abilities. And we also want to look at treatment in our athletic program by looking at equivalents of other athletic benefits and opportunities where we look at something we refer to as the laundry list, which is an 11 program area. And so again, just to refresh your memories, when we look at opportunities, participation opportunities, and we're looking at the three prong test or the three part test, we look at one of these three items. So school needs to comply with one of these three prongs, not all three. First prong being substantial proportionality, where your female athletic participation must be substantially proportionate to your female enrollment. And I'm focusing on females because uh, Title IX, although it protects all students relative to athletics, it has been used to correct the historical disparities for female students because female student athletes have been so far behind. And I can attest to that because I went to high school in the 70s and really saw the effects of what Title IX did for females in sports, um, not to mention STEM programs and other things like that. But um, again, it's, it's really been used to correct the disparities for the historically underrepresented agenda. So you have substantial proportionality. If the school does not meet that measure, then you can move to the second prong, which is history and continuing practice of program expansion, where the school needs to show that they have, they have developed a pattern or a history of, of expanding or uh, improving their athletic opportunities for females, the historically underrepresented gender. If the school does not comply with prong one or prong two, you go to prong three, where you need to show that you are fully and effectively accommodating the, again, historically underrepresented gender, and that's usually done through surveys, conversations with students, um, many different avenues that you can use to suffice prong three. As far as the um, audit process review, uh, these are, this is what, what, what I did. This is my typical process. We did a student interest survey, which we rolled out early in the spring. And we had all students, all students, not just student athletes, all students in the school's um, grades eight through 12. And um, I analyzed those results. Then we did questionnaires for coaches, all the coaches, uh, for selected student athletes and other athletics personnel. Uh, we also, I also conducted interviews with coaches and selected student athletes. I did facility site visits where I viewed all of your athletic facilities and analyzed those. And other data that I collected from the athletic department, rosters, schedules, all sorts of uh, other data that goes into the process as well. And I used, and I usually use as a guide, the OCR's investigator's manual, which 
takes you meticulously through the process to analyze each piece of the athletic uh, program. And so essentially here's what, what I wanted to share with you tonight relative to the findings. And first of all, after analyzing all the data that was collected using the mechanisms on the pre previous page, or the previous slide rather, I concluded on, the, on several findings. And I divided the findings, uh, the finding concerns into basically two categories. Major concerns that are the ones that I believe if, if someone filed a complaint uh, with the OCR, that the OCR would, there would be enough um, of, of an issue or concern to cause the OCR uh, to institute an investigation of the school's athletics program compliance. And then the other category is the moderate or minor concerns that are ones that I believe are areas where the school district could improve upon moving forward. Now let me say at the outset that finding disparities or issues in the school's athletic program is not a cause for blame or panic or failure. This is how it works. I've, I've done many audits in my career. I'm doing more and more now that I'm retired from public education and, and school districts and athletic directors are realizing that I'm retiring and now I'm consulting. I'm do, I, I've had a banner year. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of audits. And I will tell you that no matter what school I'm looking at, I'm going to find an issue somewhere. So don't look at this as, oh my gosh, this is just things that I want to point out that, that we can do better here. So please don't, don't take it as a, as a negative. It's simply, these, these issues are simply an indication that there's areas where the school district can do better, or hopefully the district will consider the recommendations provided and continue to move the program in a compliance direction. And I will say again, I offer, in my uh, report, I do offer recommendations, and you, you can take the recommendations and, and use whatever recommend, rec recommendations you'd like, or you can ignore them. I mean, this is, this is my analysis of your athletic program today. Today, as it is today. And year to year, it ebbs and flows. So it may look a little different next year. And, and that's just how it moves. Um, but this is what I saw as of <clears throat> the 2018-2019 school year. And I did look at two years, 2017-2018, 2018-2019. So if we look at the major concerns that I saw, just share with you very quickly, um, these are the ones that I think have enough um, significance to them that could cause an OCR complaint to be filed. And when you look at participation opportunities, and remember, that's the three-pronged test. And so I felt that at this point in time, None, n no one of the three prongs has been met. I mean, we're close on one, but we're not quite there. And if you look at prong one, substantial proportionality, in 2017, 2018, the differential between female enrollment percentage and the percentage of females participating in athletics was 2%. That's pretty good. But when you come to 2018 and 2019, the differential percentage between female enrollment percentage and female athletic participation was 8%, which equals to 64 fewer opportunities for girls, which I felt the OCR could possibly look at as, well, you know what, that's enough for another team, or uh, maybe there are teams that exist that could absorb more participation slots and so forth. So, what we want to examine is why we went from 2% to 8% in a year's time. Remember, ebb and flow, a lot of factors play into this. So we, we want to look at that and see if we can figure out why that gap widened. And we also want to look at ways to increase girls' participation to close that gap as we move forward in time. Um, so again, we want to look at different ways to increase female opportunities. We'll probably want to survey the girls, survey all female students, find out what, what they're thinking. We want to maybe take a look at cut policies. We want to talk to students. We want to monitor their interest, try to find ways to increase opportunities as we move forward through this. And that's some of the recommendations that I have for that part. 
under locker rooms, practice, and competition facilities, and very briefly, just kind of giving you the highlights. Um, I, I did recognize there's a general shortage of locker room space, which I get can be very challenging relative to, you know, adding facilities and creating more room. Um, there, there are many teams that share locker rooms during the same season that creates a lot of o overcrowding conditions that kind of can stretch into a risk management issue with relative to safety and um, possible theft issues. And I heard from student athletes and coaches that there were some theft issues going uh, through the seasons. Um, it, girls teams, it, in, during the fall season, there were girls teams that were required to vacate their locker rooms to accommodate visiting football teams for home Friday night football games. And again, this is not a criticism. This is trying to manage the locker room space that is there, but maybe we want to look at ways in which we can rotate locker rooms so that girls' teams are not always being bumped out of their locker room on a Friday night. I heard a lot of um, a lot from coaches and student athletes, both in the questionnaires and in the interviews, uh, relative to artificial turf and the need for turf. And I, I will tell you right off the bat, I'm not here to advocate for artificial turf. I just wanted to bring that to your attention. I also, so, also saw comments on the survey relative to artificial turf as well, as well. And although most teams that practice and compete on grass fields are to a large degree disadvantaged, generally all of them, uh, I believe a case could possibly be made where more girls are more girls teams are disadvantaged uh, relative to the grass surfaces and being displaced and relative to fewer boy, boys teams where those conditions appear. Um, you know, one of my concerns is with field hockey. Field hockey takes a very, nowadays, I mean, it's not the game I played. <laughs> it is a much different game today and the conditions of the playing surface are very important relative to field hockey and uh, any girls that want to play at the next level and, and the speed and the, the necessity of having a fast surface is, you know, it, it almost equates to the days of, of uh, all weather tracks. You know, back in the days when you know, one or two schools got an all-weather track. Everybody thought, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. Now everybody has them, and nobody could even think about running on a cinder track anymore. Uh, so it's that evolution of, of sports and, and how things evolve. And, um, you know, we want to make sure we can provide the best for our student athletes. Um, also relative to field space and field... Um, conditions, I heard a lot from lacrosse and soccer, both boys and girls, relative to having to play four games in a week because they couldn't get on their fields because of weather. And the weather conditions caused the fields to be unplayable. So they wound up really getting their schedules backed up. Um, also, there were some teams that felt they lost home field advantage. Uh, in some cases for postseason competition because their fields were not playable and they had to play on a field, on a turf field at somewhere else at another school. And I also heard from some coaches and from student athletes about losing practice times on, on fields because they were just not playable. And then finally, under the locker rooms, practice and competition facilities is the issue of the softball. I know that's being addressed. And I do have some more uh, comments about that as we move through the slide presentation, so I'll just hold off on that. But the third bullet, the allocation of travel, transportation benefits, and per diem allowances, I wanted to focus on transportation because I did hear from girls swimming that not all girls swimmers could go to away meets because there wasn't enough room on the bus. And so we probably need to look at correcting that. I think that's a pretty easy fix, but certainly one that really sticks out that, you know, competitions are very important to the OCR. Kids go out for sports to compete. 
and so we want to make sure everybody can ride the bus. Under the moderate or minor concerns, again, these are not major concerns, just to highlight a few. I know you have booster club oversight. You have a policy 915, which is great. Just keep an eye on your booster clubs and keep working together. We, I know we value our booster clubs. They're so important to uh, helping our athletic programs function. So we want to make sure that we continue that relationship. Game and practice times and scheduling, we just want to make sure that we're scheduling the same number of games and competitions for like sports, that we're maxing out our schedules and, and creating as many competitive opportunities as allowed by the PIAA. Housing and dining facilities, of course not housing, but dining, we want to make sure that any teams that want to have pre or post game meals, that we find ways to make that available to them, whether it's through a booster club or what have you. But just, you know, again, minor, just keep an eye on it. Years and experience, quality compensation, assignment of coaches. Um, we want to make sure that we're using the same effort to find the best coaches for our girls teams as we are our boys teams. And generally speaking, that that is happening. But I just saw some few red flags that, you know, we could do better. Nature of publicity, marketing, media services for athletic programs. Again, this is this is really something for all our sports teams. They would all like to see more publicity and more recognition uh, across the board. And then recruiting resources, not in the term, not in terms of being recruited to the next level or to the college level, but this is this ties in with the coaching piece. And uh, it, the more you know, it, it's relatively. Um, it's really viewed as if the more in-house coaches you have, the more advantage and the more access they have to student athletes in the buildings. So we want, again, when we're hiring coaches, we want to try to, you know, obviously we want to try to hire in-house coaches, but I know that's not always possible. It's challenging getting coaches in, in certain sports to begin, begin with. So we want to, again, find the best coaches for all our teams. and provide access so those coaches are able to uh, walk the halls, so to speak, to recruit kids to their, their teams and have conversations with kids. And just quickly, recommendations, just a few that I highlighted, and many of these are already in progress. And so we're moving in the right direction, improving the opportunities. I'm working with Mr. Palladino to create those opportunities and find ways to um, you know, close that gap, as I mentioned, about substantial proportionality. Uh, we want to make sure we're accommodating all of our student athletes going to away games. We're, you're in the process of upgrading your softball facility. Uh, again, continuing the oversight of your booster clubs, improving the publicity. And again, to the best of your ability, improve the locker room facilities and, you know, housing teams in those facilities and again, improving field facilities. And just to somewhat conclude, I just wanna, again, I know this is being taken care of, it's, it's in progress, but just to really emphasize the differences in the baseball softball facilities on the left-hand side, that picture was taken in spring of 2019, of this, spring, this past spring. Picture on your right was actually taken in 2009. And again, 19 and 9. Now that's a softball field way down there. And then in 2008, there was a report that the board received, uh, which was performed by then Superintendent Dr. Harry Morgan and then Athletic Director Mr. Anthony Palladino. And they talked about the baseball softball field disparities. And you've done upgrades to the softball field last, starting last summer. Very nice upgrades. And now you've moved the field to an upper level <clears throat> location and are starting incredible upgrades to that facility. And that facility is going to turn out to be a really fantastic facility. And I commend you for doing that and being brave to do that. So thank you for doing that and continue that progress. And just real quick about the OCR, uh, their role, and again, they are the enforcement arm of Title IX, and their responsibility is to investigate and enforce. 
uh, relative to sexual harassment in athletics. And they have few mechanisms in which they use complaints. Anyone can file a complaint relative to disparity. There are complaint reviews once in a while. You'll see them go into uh, schools and kind of check on what's happening. I've seen that done a few times with issues of sexual harassment. And they do provide technical assistance. The ultimate penalty, penalty for noncompliance is loss of your federal funds. And we hadn't seen that in 46 years up until just last year with Chicago Public Schools lost $4 million of their federal funds because of issues relative to noncompliance with sexual harassment issues in that school district, first time in 46 years. Um, so, you know, interscholastic athletics is an integral part of our educational process. It's, it's um, I don't know how many of you around this table played sports in high school or college, but, um, you know, clearly it, kids get a lot of value and benefit out of playing sports. Uh, we're the only country that has sports in our educational system and uh, something to think about. And really the true litmus test, according to the NCAA Gender Equity Task Force, is more or less if you switch programs with each group, would the receiving group be satisfied? And if the answer is no, then there's probably a problem and probably some things that need to be corrected. So, um, you know, I commend you for taking on this initiative and I'm seeing more and more schools take a proactive measure. This is really a proactive measure. You have wonderful student athletes here. You have fantastic coaches. Your, your coaching um, experience when you add up all the years is phenomenal. Um, they truly care about the kids that they are in charge of. Um, so I commend you for having an outstanding athletic program and I, I hope that you'll continue to work towards gender equity compliance because you're, you're right on the right path. So thank you for your time and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Okay, uh, for my fellow board members, uh, I don't know if you have a pressing uh, question tonight. For Ms. Pennypacker, uh, what I would suggest respectfully is if you do, uh, certainly you can send the, the question uh, to Dr. Bedden or uh, we could provide uh, Ms. Pennypacker's uh, email address. Uh, you could contact her uh, anytime after this evening uh, with a specific question. So seeing no urgent questions, again, once again, Ms. Pennypacker, thank you. Thank you for your flexibility tonight. And uh, you did that under uh, 30 minutes, so thank you. <laughs>